right. I think we are working. All right. I think we're working. Um, so we're going to leave it at that. Um, I Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of my darlings and hamburgers. Tad here. Um, <coughs> dealing slightly with a small midwinter cold, nothing serious. Um, everybody else pretty well, generally. Um, the normal craziness uh, surrounds as usual, but I'm not going to talk about that right at the moment. Um, what am I going to talk about? First of all, I'm going to apologize to all of you lovely people who are uh, here for the 1 a.m. reading um, because you guys always seem to be the ones who have the stuff go wrong. And part of that's because I guess it's more likely to go wrong between Sunday evening and the next Sunday morning than it is between the two Sunday slots if that makes any sense. Um, so anyway, I am now doing this differently. I had to um, after last week's debacle um, and uh, seem to have got it straightened out, although it's odd because now I have to shift back and forth um, between my comments, um, which I can only see a few at a time. I don't know why that is. I have no idea. Um, it's just Facebook's weird that way. I used to be able to see most of my comments at one time. Um, 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 and so it's very hard to keep uh, an eye now on the comments. I click on the comments, the comments go away. When I click on the comments, I get a few comments. Um, it's giving me the option to insert an emoji, which is absolutely useless to me. Um, but I can say hello to the people who are here at the moment. Um, so I will do that, and then I will babble away. So I see Holger. See, I'm just taking this off a list now, so bear with me. I, I'm not seeing actual comments, and if you wanted to be private, I apologize. But I see uh, Holger. I see Petra. I see Christina. I see Kristen. Hello, Kristen. Um, Wouter. Good to see you, Wouter. Ronnie. A pleasure. Andre. Tracy. Rosalba. Tom. Hello, Tom. Iris. Becky. Isaac. Anamika. Chris. Nicole. Um, Penny. And Christy. And two more. And it won't tell me who the two are. Come on. Jeremy. I just saw Jeremy showed up there as I was working at it. Um, Nicole Penny and four more now it says so it won't it won't tell me who else is on this thing is just maddening one of these days I'm going to get a proper setup and and this will all work the way I want it to or even maybe like back in my radio days I will get an engineer um, that was glorious back when I was doing radio many 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 years ago so long ago that radio stations ran on um, steam. Steam, yeah, that, that's all radio stations had to run on huge boilers and pistons and all that stuff because electricity had not been invented. But anyway, back in those long ago days um, when I was doing radio, I actually had engineers, um, not for everything, obviously, but for certain kinds of shows, um, certainly where there was a lot of complicated uh, jiggering of guests and things like that. I had engineers who would do the work part while I would just babble, which as you know, is one of the only things that I can do effectively. Um, clearly I'm not a master of broadcasting or streaming technology, um, but I'm doing my best. So anyway, hello to all of you, lovely to see you. Sorry for the confusion. Sorry for the aborted attempts to read. As far as I know, it's working tonight. Everybody seems to be checking in and saying hello, hello, hello. Um, Vouter points out that the four more might be private, possibly, but I, 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 considering that it'll only give me a certain amount of comments at a time and, and it slipped one more in. Well, anyway, we won't worry about it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, so I am going to continue on as if I know what I'm doing, which in fact is my recipe for adulting. 
Um, my kids are frequently, <laughs> now that some of them are out on their own and some others are soon to be out on their own, they're frequently saying to me, adulting is so hard. I'm like, yeah, and it's even harder when you're supporting four kids. So time for you to start supporting yourselves. But yeah, it is adulting. Adulting is a difficult thing, and it's even more difficult when you mix technology into it. Um, I'll leave out what how difficult it gets when you get having to make add having to make a living into it because that's just a whole other kettle of rotted fish. But um, so I but I'm slowly at least getting things together and I'm back here this week and I apologize again for last week. I I don't know what happened. Something changed between the software, the streaming software, and Facebook. And so I've had to now, I'm still doing it with both the same things, but I'm doing it in a quite different way. So Facebook is uh, broadcasting, but it's lagging several seconds, probably more than that, behind what I'm looking at right now, which is the streaming software. So right now, you're, while I'm saying this, what's on the screen is what was ever was on the screen, my weird face, but you know, whatever I was saying, 20 seconds ago, a minute and a half ago. I have no idea, and I'm not going to try to figure it out. And as I said, when I'm looking at this software, I can't see any comments. I used to be able to get the, comp, the, the chat feed on the thing, but I can't now. Anyway, God, what a pain in the butt. I have been spending most of the last two days trying to iron out one chapter in the navigator's children um it has the innocuous sounding title of chapter 31 there is no numer numerological or numerological significance to it whatsoever it is simply a hinge chapter where something changes in the plot um that happens all the time but this is an important one and it has to it, it has to make sense in the context. It ha it's a major thing that happens, and it has to arise organically from the process of the other things that are going on. Um, I, I'm sorry it's vague, but I cannot, obviously, you know, a book that hasn't even published yet that some people, some, some kind, quasi-deluded people are waiting for. I'm not giving anything away, but it's, it's I'm not even telling you the chapter title. Actually, I, I will tell you the chapter title. It's Silent Laughter, Chapter 31, Silent Laughter, because um, that's not going to tell you anything. But it is, as sometimes happens, you know, you'll be steaming along and going, yeah, wow, everything's going really smoothly here. Yeah, I don't think I have to do much editing here at all. Page goes by, page goes by, page. And then you hit a certain spot, in this case, Chapter 31, and everything screeches to a halt as you realize Oh my God, this isn't just a polish here I have to do. I have to really change a bunch of stuff because the emphasis is all screwed up and it's not going to feel right and it won't, it won't happen in a seamless way where the readers both understand what's going on and believe that within the context that it makes sense. So I've torn it down. I literally have four different copies of this chapter and broken up for different reasons into different... It, I mean, they're all whole copies of it, but they're all broken up into different reasons for it's too hard to explain. But um, so I'm working with all these things and trying to make sure I'm keeping them straight. So I don't anyway, that's what the last couple of days have been like for me. Um, and it's it's interesting. It's challenging. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. But it's that's why writing for a living is work because it's not all fun. Um, so I'm ripping things apart and I'm throwing things in the air. Metaphorically speaking, I'm throwing things on the floor and grinding them beneath my heel. Um, I'm throwing, throwing other things into the mix to see if they work. And if they don't, I'm throwing them down too and trying other things and moving stuff around and cutting stuff out and putting it back in. Anyway, but... The, the, the positive news is that I think once I get past that, it will be much faster sailing. So we are moving toward having Navigator's Children finished. And so far, it seems okay. I, I'm, I'm not complaining. Um, my wife at least has said that a few parts she thought were really good, and, and the other parts were mostly just things that just needed some fixes here and there. And that's Deb, Deborah is not 
overly fulsome. I mean, she likes my work. That's, you know, that started before we were a romantic couple because she bought my books for the English market. Uh, well, she bought Dragonbone Chair and its, its uh, sequels for the English market and uh, put a big pitch and push in on them back in the day. That is not why I fell for her either, although she was a very good publisher and I was grateful for the things that she did. Um, but uh, so, you know, I, Deb's been positive about what she's seen so far. I always get very pessimistic at this stage just because I've been working on it for so long that even though I still have to be very attentive to everything I'm doing and read everything really carefully and think about everything and you know, at the same time, I'm trying to get rid of stuff, so I have to adopt a slightly negative way of looking at my own material and my own book that I've spent, you know, a long time working on. Um, and I also have to, um, that's the word that I'm looking for, I, I have, I just, I get, I get, I'm worn out with it, you know, I've been working on it for so long, um, and especially because this is the final volume. Um, there are times I just I want to be working on anything else. I I you know I'd rather be working in a Burger King. Um, this passes, thank God, because I've worked in places like that. <laughs> I've had regular jobs. I I've had all manner of not very good regular jobs before I became a full time writer. Before I was brave enough to step off the high dive and see what happened. So. Anyway, that's what's going on with Navigator's Children. I'm, I'm stuck on one chapter, but I think I broke it today. I think I, I crushed it and um, bent it to my will. So we will see. I should be able to finish that up in just a few minutes tomorrow and then be on to chapter 32, which, fingers crossed, is not another morass of suffering, another hellhole, another slough of despond. But we will find out. I, I, I'm... I know at a certain point the, the, the editing is going to get easier because writing the end of the book was much different than writing this kind of section of the book where I had to stitch my two different versions of one part written almost two years before the final part, you know. Um, I am very inarticulate tonight. As I explained, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold. So... Let me just quickly look to see if anybody else is here that I should say hello to. I can't tell. It's all from Holger. <laughs> um, but it's up to 55 comments now, and it'll only show me a few of them. So if I've missed saying hello to any of the rest of you, I apologize. There's nothing I can do about it right now. I'm just, I'm just struggling for sanity. That's all. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's wait till see if I, my face will come back into focus again. Every time I flick the screen away for some reason, it goes out of focus. Okay, I suggest you remove all children from the room and distract any pets because I'm going to lean in really close now. I know, it's frightening. It's frightening just seeing what years and years of writing fantasy and science fiction can do to a person. But I'm trying to get it to focus. Sometimes it will focus when you get close enough. And then if you pull the focus button, now it's not doing it. Oh, God. Oh, well. It'll find me at some point. Okay, we were reading. I'm going to read because what the heck else can I do here? Um, is there any other news I need to tell you? No, we've had several days without rain here, and that's a big deal. Not that we don't need the rain. We do. We are thrilled. Even as we drown, we are thrilled to be drowning in life-giving water <laughs> here in California. But, uh, no, it's true. It's true. People often say that here as they drown. At least it's it's going to be good for the reservoirs. Glub, glub, glub. Um, so... That's been good, but I, I will tell you a few days of no rain have not gone amiss, as any of the, those of you out there who are in this part of California will attest. I think you will agree with me. Um, yes, we'll, we're, we'll still take more. We'll ha be happy to have some more, but it's especially when you have a, a hydro, not hydrophobic, because that technically means rabid. When you have a rain phobic dog like I do, it's nice to have a few days off when we can let him out to run around in the yard and take him out for walks and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so 
Last time when we were reading, Simon and the rest of his crew, including Binnebeck and the other soldiers who came with him out of Nagelmann, had essentially been saved by the Sithi from Ingen Jaeger and a bunch of uh, scholarly of called Skrikes Rimmersmen. Um, and Ingen survived, but that, you know, we already heard about that. So Simon and Binnebeck and the rest have been taken in by the Sithi. And although the Sithi haven't been overtly unpleasant to them, they're definitely different and odd and a little frightening. Um, but the Sithi have just given them a meal, and after some hesitation, the mortals have begun to, to eat and drink some of the Sithi liquor and started settling in. So um, I will drop back a paragraph or two and read from where I was reading at the end, and then uh, we will go and uh, continue from there. As the meal wore on, and a seemingly inexhaustible river of wine replenished the wooden goblets, the Rimmersmen and the two Arkenlandish guardsmen began to enjoy themselves. At one point, Sludig stood, tumbler sloshing in his hand, and proposed a hearty toast to his new Sithy friends. Jariki smiled and nodded, but Kendra Jaro stiffened. When Sludig swung into an old northern drinking song, the prince's uncle slipped quietly off to the corner of the broad cavern to stare into the rippling, lamp-lit pond. The other Sithy at table laughed as Sludig sang the choruses in his braying voice and swayed to his tipsy rhythm whispering occasionally among themselves. Sludig and Haystan and Grimrick seemed quite happy now, and even Binnebeck was grinning as he sucked on a pear rind. But Simon, remembering the enthralling music he had heard the Sithi play, felt a glow of shame for his companion, as though the Rimmersmen were a festival bear dancing for crumbs in Main Row. After watching for some while, he got up, wiping his hands on his shirt front, Binnebeck rose, too, and after asking Jariki's permission, went down the covered passageway to have a look after Kantaka. The three soldiers were all laughing uproariously among themselves, telling, Simon had no doubt, drunken soldier jokes. He walked to one of the wall niches to examine the strange lamps. Abruptly, he was reminded of the glowing crystal Morgenes had given him. Could it have, could it have been Sithy work? and felt a cold, lonely tug at his heart. He lifted one of the lamps and saw a faint shadow of the bones in his hand, as though the flesh was only muddied water. Stare as he might, he could not fathom how the flame had been introduced to the inside of the translucent crystal. Sensing someone watching, he turned. Jariki was staring, cat eyes agleam, on the far side of the fire circle. Simon started, surprised. The prince nodded. Hey, Stan, the wine gone to his shaggy head, had challenged one of the Sithi, the one Anai had named Kyushapo, to wrist wrestle. Kyushapo, yellow braided, dressed in black and gray, was receiving drunken advice from Grimrick. It was clear why the skinny guardsman thought his aid well directed. The Sitha was a head shorter than Haystan and looked to be barely more than half his weight. As the Sitha, with a bemused expression, leaned forward across the smooth stone to clasp Haystan's broad hand, Jariki stood up and edged past them, making his graceful way across the chamber toward Simon. It was still difficult, Simon thought, to reconcile this confident, clever being with the maddened creature he had found in the Cotsman's wire. Still, when Jeriki turned his head a certain way or flexed his long-jointed fingers, it was possible to see again the wildness that had frightened and fascinated. And whenever the firelight caught the prince's gold-flecked amber eyes, they shone ancient as jewels from the black soil of the forest. Come, say, Omen, the Sitha said. I will show you something. He slid his hand under the youth's elbow and steered him toward the pool where Kendra Jaro sat trailing his fingers in the water. As they passed the fire, Simon saw that the wrist-wrestling contest was at full heat. 
The opponents were locked in a struggle, neither with an advantage yet, but Haystan's bearded face was clenched in a lock-toothed grin of strain. The slender Sitha, by contrast, showed little effect. Sorry, showed little effect from the standoff, except his grey-clad arm quivering with the tension of their striving. Simon did not think this boded well for Haystan's chances. Sluting, watching the small frustrate the large, sat open-mouthed. Jiriki fluttered, fluted, Jiriki fluted something to his uncle as they approached, but Kendra Jaro did not respond. His ageless face seemed closed, shut like a door. Simon followed the prince past him along the cavern wall. A moment later, before his astonished eyes, Jiriki disappeared. He had only stepped into another tunnel, one that hooked around behind the stone sluice of the little waterfall. Simon went in after him. The tunnel curled upward in rough stone steps lit by a row of lamps. Follow me, please, Jiriki said and began to climb. It seemed they mounted far up into the hill, spiraling around and around for some time. At last they passed the final lamp and traveled a careful way in near darkness until Simon finally became aware of the gleam of stars before him. A moment later the passageway widened into a small cave, one end of which was open to the night sky. He followed Jiriki to the cavern's edge, which was a waist-high lip of stone. The rock face of the hill dropped away below, ten bare cubits down to the tops of the tall over evergreens, fifty more to the snow-matted ground. The night was clear, the stars shining fiercely against the blackness, and the forest was all around like a vast secret. After they had stood for some while, Jiriki said, I owe you a life, man-child. Do not fear, I will forget. Simon said nothing, afraid to speak in case he should break the spell that allowed him to stand in the very midst of the forest night, a spy in God's dark garden. An owl called. There passed another interval of silence, then the Sitha lightly touched Simon's arm and pounded at, pointed out above the silent ocean of trees. There, to the north, beneath Luyasa's staff, he indicated a line of three stars in the lowest part of the velvety sky. Can you see the outline of the mountains? Simon stared. He thought there might be a faint luminescence on the murky horizon, the barest hint of some great white shape so far away as to seem out of reach of the same moonlight that glowed on trees and snow beneath them. I think so, he said quietly. That is where you go. The peak men call Urmsheim is in that range, although you would need a clearer night to see it well. He sighed. Your friend Binabik tonight spoke of lost to Metai. Once it could be seen from here, away there in the east, he pointed into darkness, from this very perch. But that was in my great-grandfather's day. In daylight, the Senianzin, the Tower of the Walking Dawn, would catch the rising sun in its roofs of crystal and gold. They say it was like a beautiful torch burning on the morning horizon. He broke off, turning his eyes finally to Simon, the rest of his face obscured by night shadow. Tumitai is long buried, he said and shrugged. Nothing lasts, not even the Scythi, not even time itself. How, how old are you? Jiriki smiled, teeth glinting in the moonlight. Older than you, Seoman. Let us go down now. You have seen and survived many things today, and no doubt you need sleep. When they got back to the firelit cavern, the three guardsmen were wrapped in their cloaks, snoring lustily. 
Binibic had returned and sat listening as several Sithi sang a slow, mournful song that droned like a beehive and ran like a river and seemed to fill the cave like the thick scent of some rare dying flower. Curled in his own cloak, watching the firelight flicker on the stones above him, Simon was lulled to sleep by the strange music of Jeriki's tribe. Chapter 39 High King's Hand Simon awakened to find the cavern light changed. The fire still burned, thin yellow flames among the white ashes, but the lamps had been extinguished. Daylight filtered down through crevices in the ceiling that had been invisible the night before, transforming the stone chamber into a pillared hall of light and shadow. His three soldier companions still slept, tangled in their cloaks, snoring, sprawled like battle casualties. The cavern was otherwise empty, but for Binibic, who sat cross-legged before the fire, tootling absently on his walking stick flute. Simon sat up groggily. Where are the Sithi? Binibic did not turn, but piped a few more notes. Greetings, good friend he said at last. Was your sleep satisfying? I suppose, Simon grunted, rolling back over to stare at the dust flecks shimmering near the cavern's roof. Where did the Sithi go? Out for hunting, as it were. Come and raise yourself. I need your assistance. Simon groaned, but dragged himself up into a sitting position. Hunting for giants? he asked a short while later through a mouthful of fruit. Haystan's snores were becoming so loud that Binibic had put his flute down in disgust. Hunting whatever is threatening to their borders, I suppose. The troll stared at something before him on the stone floor. Kikasut! This is making no good sense. I am not liking it one least bit. What doesn't make sense? Simon lazily surveyed the rock chamber. Is this a Sithy house? Binibic looked over, frowning. I suppose <coughs> it is good you have regained your ability for the asking of many questions at once. No, this is not a Sithy house as such. It is, I am thinking, what Jeriki called it. A hunting lodge, a place for their hunters to stay while roaming a field. As for your other question, it is these bones that are nonsensical, or rather too much sense they make. The knuckle bones lay in a heap before Binibic's knees. Simon looked them over. What does that mean? I will tell you. Perhaps it would be good you are using this time to wash the dirt and blood and juice of berries from your face. The troll flashed a sour yellow grin, pointing to the pool in the corner. There is suitable for washing. He waited until Simon had ducked his head once in the bitingly chill water. Ah! The youth said, shivering. Cold! You may be seeing, Binibic resumed, unperturbed by Simon's complaints, that I have been at throwing my bones this morning. What they are saying is this, the shadowed path, unwrapped dart, and black crevice. Much confusion and worry this is causing me. Why? Simon splashed more water on his face and rubbed it off with his jerkin sleeve, which was itself none too clean. Because I was casting the bones before we left Naglamund, Benedict said crossly, and the same figures I was getting. Exactly. But why should that be bad? Something bright lying at the pool's edge caught his eye. He picked it up carefully and discovered it was a round-looking gla round glass set in a splendidly carved wooden frame. The rim of the dark glass was etched with unfamiliar characters. 
bad. It often is when things are always the same, Benedict answered. But with the bones, it is more than that. The bones, to me, are guides to wisdom, yes? Mm-hmm. Simon polished the mirror on his shirt front. Well, what if you were opening your book of the Adon to discover that all its pages suddenly were having only one verse, the same verse, over then over? Do you mean a book I had already seen that hadn't been like that before? I suppose it would be magic. Well, then, Benedict said mollified, there you are seeing my problem. There are hundreds of ways the bones can find themselves. To be the same cast six times in running, I can only think it bad. Much as I have studied, still I am not liking the word magic, but some force there is gripping the bones as a powerful wind is pushing all flags the same way. Simon? Are you listening? Staring fixedly at the mirror, Simon was astonished to find an unfamiliar face looking back. The stranger had an elongated, large bone face, blue shadowed eyes, and a growth of red gold whiskers on chin, cheeks, and upper lip. Simon was further amazed to realize that, of course, he was only seeing himself thinned and weathered by his travels the first growth of man's beard darkening his jaws. What kind of face was this, he suddenly wondered. He still had not a man's features, worn and stern, but he fancied that he had sloughed off some of his moon-calfishness. Nonetheless, he found something disappointing in the long-chinned, shock-haired youth who stared back at him. Is this what I looked like? to Miriamel, like a farmer's son, a plowboy. And even as he thought of the princess, it seemed that he saw a flash of her features in the glass, almost growing out of his own. For a dizzy instant, they were meshed together like two cloudy souls in one body. An instant later, it was Miriamel alone whose face he saw, or Malachias, rather, for her hair was short and black, and she wore boy's clothes. A colorless sky lay beyond her, spotted with dark thunderheads. There was another, too, who stood just behind, a round-faced man in a gray hood. Simon had seen him before. He was sure, so sure. Who was he? Simon! Binnebick's voice splashed him like cold water, just as the elusive name flitted within reach. Startled, he juggled the mirror for a moment. When he clutched it tight again, no face was there but his own. "'Are you turning sick?' the troll asked, worried by the slack, puzzled expression Simon turned toward him. "'No, I don't think so. "'Then if you are washed,' Come to help me. We shall go to speaking of the auguries later, when your attention is not so delicate. Benedict stood, dropping the knuckle bones back into their leather sack. Benedict went first down the ice chute, warning Simon to keep his toes pointed and his hands close to his head. The headlong seconds rushing down the tunnel were like a dream of falling from a high place, and when he thumped down into the soft snow beneath the tunnel mouth, bright, chill daylight in his eyes, he was content to sit for a moment and enjoy the feel of his heart's rapid beating. A moment later, he was bowled over by a surprising clout on the back, followed by the smothering descent of a mountain of muscle and fur. Kantaka! he heard Binnebick shout, laughing. If it is your friends who are receiving such treatment, I am glad I am no enemy. Simon pushed the wolf away, gasping only to face a renewed rough-tongued assault on his face. At last, with Binnebick's aid, he rolled free. 
Kantaka sprang to her feet, whining excitedly, circled the youth and troll once, then sprang away into the snowy wood. Now, Finnebick said, brushing snow from his black hair, we must be finding where the Sithi have been putting up our horses. Not far, Kanuk man. Simon jumped. He turned to see a line of Sithi file silently out of the trees, Jeriki's green-jacketed uncle at its head. And why do you seek them? Finnebick smiled. Certainly not for escaping you, good Kendra Jarl. Your hospitality is too lavish for us to hurry away from it. No, there are certain things only I wish to make sure we still have. Things I was obtaining with some trouble at Naglamon uh, that we will need on the roads ahead. Kendra Jaro looked down on the troll expressionlessly for a moment, then signaled to two of the other Sithi. Sijandi, Kyushapo, show them. The yellow-haired pair walked a few steps along the hillside, away from the tunnel mouth, then stopped, waiting for Simon and the troll to follow. When Simon looked back, he saw Kendra Jaro still watching, an unreadable expression in his bright, narrowed eyes. They found the horses put up a few furlongs away in a small cavern hidden by a pair of snow-laden pine trees. The cave was snug and dry. All six horses were contentedly chewing away at a pile of sweet-smelling hay. Where did all this come from? Simon asked, surprised. We often bring our own horses, Kyushapo replied, speaking the western tongue carefully. Does it surprise you to find we have a stable for them? As Binnebeck rooted around in one of the saddlebags, Simon explored the cavern, noting the light spilling through a crevice high in the wall and a stone trough filled with clean water. Propped against the far side was a pile of helmets, axes, and swords. Simon recognized one of the blades as his own from the armory at Naglamond. These are ours, Binnebeck, he said. How did they get here? Kishapo spoke slowly, as though to a child. We put them here after we took them from you and your companions. Here they are safe and dry. Simon looked at the Sitha suspiciously. But I thought that you couldn't touch iron, that it was poison to you. He stopped short, fearful that he had ventured onto forbidden ground. But Kyushapu... Kyushapo only exchanged a glance with his silent companion before replying. So, you have heard tales of the days of Black Iron, he said. Yes, it was once thus, but those of us who survived those days have learned much. We know now what waters to drink and from which certain springs so that we can handle mortal iron for a little time without harm. Why did you think we allowed you to keep your coat of mail? But of course we have no liking for it and do not use it, or even touch it when there is no need. He looked over to Binnebeck, who was still rummaging intently in the traveling bags. We shall leave you to finish your search, the Sitha said. You will find nothing missing, at least Nothing you had when you came into our hands. Binnebeck looked up. Of course, he said. I am only in worry over things that may have been lost during the fighting of yesterday. Of course, Kishapo replied. He and the quiet Sijandi went out beneath the branches of the entrance. 